Thank you so much, Lauren, for being willing to let us interview you. Uh, you were here with Commissioner Sheila uh, Craig to share some of the work that the two of you have been doing in addressing racial disparities in healthcare. And I would love to hear um, uh, what wisdom that you would have been able to share had we had more time uh, with the rest of the students. Yeah, um, the presentation that we were gonna we were gonna share. Um, I think uh, Mr. Miller talked to Sheila Craig ahead of time about kind of what his goals were, and they were kind of about putting into perspective how even though we might come from different demographic backgrounds as people living in this country, we've been conditioned to see um, things through the same cultural lens. And so exposing that invisible lens that we're all conditioned to work from um, to help the students as they, and I think that she thought that we were gonna be working with the students, but as they go into what will likely be helping professions as they go on to be pastors or reverends or social workers, that to be aware of the lens that they bring to that work. Um, and why I say that is that sometimes we don't think about the way that we all participate in the same cultural, uh, in the same cultural practices influence our perspectives. So a lot of times, Sheila Craig's background is in um, child welfare, as is mine actually. Um, you don't think about how when we're conditioned to think about neglect, for example. Um, kids are over-removed for neglect, especially children of color are over-removed for neglect. And what somebody thinks of as neglect in, in this state and in the United States, I think, has a lot to do with our culture. So we might think of a kid who's got three pairs of pants and four t-shirts, and he's always wearing those things, and that family gets reported because the teacher thinks that that child's dirty or that child's not being well taken care of, that oftentimes that's a child of color, they do end up getting removed um, into the foster care system because somebody um, who has you know good intentions, who's well-meaning, um, will think that that child is being neglected and think that that child is um, better off in a foster family that can provide more for them, but that that really isn't like the job that they should be doing. Mm -hmm. So the work that she does actually grew out of that exact problem, the over-removal of children of color, um, and how does the cultural practices that we all participate in, these invisible, uh, invisible, sorry, invisible elements of our culture, how do they influence disproportionate outcomes for people of color? Um, in my work, so I, I used to work with her, um, now at the Institute, my work is also kind of similarly focused in that place. Um, how do we institutionalize whiteness? And when we do that, we also institutionalize anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. And how does that manifest disparate outcomes for people of color? Mm -hmm. That was a long answer. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, what are some of the ways that you've seen whiteness institutionalized? Yeah, um, so one of those Exactly what we were talking about, child welfare, and that was the place where this work started, um, that white families tend to get calls for things like physical abuse and sexual abuse, um, but they're underreported. So these are serious, you know, serious things that go underreported um, and then are less likely to be validated. So to get a call for something like that, for someone to start a case for something like that, there has to be sort of physical evidence to begin with. Um, but those children are, are a lot less likely to be put into foster homes or for the family's uh, case to even progress past the investigation stage because it can go on for services before it gets to like the foster care. Um, so usually they're closed in the investigation stage. That means that white children in age, you know, grow up in homes that um, oftentimes are abusive. Um, but on the other end, families of color get calls for things primarily neglect, um, and I think that we, this is kind of like a, that institutionalization, right, where we're thinking about, is it okay for a child to grow up in a home where they're facing actual abuse, um, versus should we remove children because they share a bedroom with their four siblings, um, because they eat, you know, mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese every night. Those kind of things are like the reason why a lot of kids of color are moved to Texas. Um, so that's one example, but then you can think of really well-known examples like over-incarceration, um, like voter suppression. Those things are, are married that typically if you become like a, a felon, they take away your right to vote. 
those things are only mirrored because we know that we over incarcerate people of color mm -hmm. um, and we'd like to keep them from being able to vote. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there are a lot of examples of how we institutionalize whiteness, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What got you initially interested in pursuing this line of work, this line of study? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if there was something that, that like put me on the path toward this kind of work. I think I always thought, of, so my, the house I grew up in, my mom and both of my brothers are social workers. Mm. Um, my dad is a retired army colonel and I think that we were, <laughs> sorry. Mm. <laughs> Um, I think that as a, and I guess both of my parents grew out of really extreme poverty. Um, uh, like they both grew up in homes that didn't have like running water. Um, and when my dad was like an adult, his family was able to like buy and build their first home that had like indoor plumbing. But my mom, um, until she had her own apartment, didn't have like indoor plumbing and didn't have like, they, they both like really, really food insecure. And so I think maybe just growing up in that family was where I became the person who I am. I, and it never occurred to me that I wouldn't do something that was oriented around people of color and poverty. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know if that was... Yeah. There's never a light bulb that came on uh, for you. It was kind of always... I think... Um, well, I guess I would say that maybe... I thought, I, th I think that I could be doing this work differently if it weren't for people like Sheila Craig and other people who do the work of educating people about racial inequity. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Texas A&M and people don't really think of that as like a, a school that's like known for social justice work or anything like that. Um, but I think precisely because they have that reputation when they have racial hate incidents on campus, they take it very seriously and they respond really quickly. And so when I got to A&M, um, they had just had some students who were in the Army Corps post like a video online when they were all like in blackface and they like simulated the lynching. And so as I was coming in as a freshman, they'd institute this policy that was like, all the, all, to graduate from the school, everyone has to get 24 hours of um, ethnic awareness courses or something. Mm -hmm. or, cultural sensitivity, I can't remember mm -hmm. what they were calling it. And through those courses, I think I started to understand racism as like an institutionalized set of practices. Because before then I really thought that like racism was something that was interpersonal. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say again that people were really patient with me because that was 2006 when I got to school and probably all the way up until 2014, I was still like really evolving, like picking up little pieces here and there, but not having like a like a foundation really, like a full foundation. And so I think that I only really arrived at it after like a long, long set of different mentors and uh, peers who were patient with me and invested in me as someone who could do this work. I think everyone really has the potential to be able to do this kind of work mm -hmm. if we're patient with them and help them build that foundation for themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You mentioned earlier that you had your law degree. Uh, can you tell me more about what got you thinking about going from college to, to law school? Um, yeah, I think I went to law school having like a, I thought that I was gonna do like civil rights work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the goal and I went to St. Mary's, which is a really, um, it's a religious school, but they, I think that Steve Miller maybe used a phrase, biblical justice, I think that they're, um, a very biblical justice oriented school and so I went there thinking that that was going to be um, what I did but just didn't find it what I do now is much more in line with what I, what I think I went to law school hoping to be able to do mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because oftentimes I mean the, the law is another one of these places where we um, we really value a, a set of 
in norms I think fall more in line with, with white culture, white American culture, mm -hmm. um, where we know that people of color have disparate outcomes. I went in trying to do immigration law and just was really um, disheartened mm -hmm. in the time that I spent working with families. And um, I worked on a, a U visa project um, and a VAWA project, VAWA Violence Against Women. Um, so if you're an undocumented woman who is married and you become a, a victim of domestic violence, there's a special visa for that. Um, but there used to be. I'm not actually sure if that's still an active visa that you can get. U visa, if you're an undocumented person here and you become a victim of a crime, um, there's a special visa for you to be able to stay. Um, and so I was working on those kind of projects, but yeah, just became <laughs> disheartened working in that system. And, mm -hmm. um, found my way to this work, so. Mm. What are the pockets of, of hope or encouragement when, when you talk about being discouraged in um, the looking at um, immigration law, now the kind of work that you're doing now? In, in what you're doing now, where are kind of those pockets of, of resistance or encouragement or however you want to phrase that? That's a really good question. Um, I think that there is, so Dr. Holly, who was on the panel this morning, um, we had a chance to talk and she said something about her work. So I don't know if, if I, how much you know about Dr. Holly, but she started a couple of years ago this inclusion, diversity, equity. I can't remember what the A is, but it's, it's like a program for students at ACC um, to help with retention and graduation rates for students of color. Um, and in the couple of years that she's actually officially been running that program, they've gotten so much done. So I was just mm -hmm. telling her that I was like, that's amazing to think about what you've been able to accomplish. And she said, I wouldn't be able to do it except for there being a community behind me, um, mm -hmm. helping me, pushing me. And I think that that's what I've also found is that like the, the thing that gives me hope is all the people who do this work and um, all the people who really believe in it and, you know, Dr. Holly, I think, works seven days a week. Sheila Craig works seven days a week. Mm -hmm. the, the people who are invested in this are, like, really invested, like, down to their core. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's hard to, like, look someone in the face and say, like, I'm going to do this work. I just, I only want to do it from nine to five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not nine to five work. Mm -hmm. But I think that I always feel encouraged by people who give so much of themselves so that the work can happen. Um, just a little bit ago, you're talking about your education and when you kind of um, were learning more about um, kind of systemic racism, like 2006, 2014, kind of getting caught up on a lot of theory. Um, with that lens, looking back at earlier parts of your life, where would you see race, racial discrimination, inequity showing up in your own family and your own community? Um, so I'm Latina, um, my dad is Puerto Rican, and he's actually the fourth generation in his family that was born into freedom, so his uh, great-grandmother's mother was a slave in Puerto Rico. Um, and my dad is somebody who's black presenting but doesn't describe himself as black. Um, Puerto Rico has a lot of colorism and a lot of... Um, like mestizaje, like we're all mixed people, so we're colorblind, but when you look at like who's doing very well in Puerto Rico and who's doing the worst, that you can predict those outcomes along phenotypic race identifiers as well. So people, you know, even within the same couple of families or something, um, where this is very common in Puerto Rico to have somebody who's European presenting and somebody who's black presenting and that they're sisters or cousins, um, that you can still predict who's going to do the best, who's going to be able to get job offers, and there are very few jobs in Puerto Rico, <laughs> um, but along these phenotypic racial lines. Um, and so when my dad was growing up, he was among like the last generation of people who had this, um, it wasn't a racial caste system the way that we think, I think caste has like a really harsh connotation, um, but it was like a based on phenotypic lines, like we give people a role in this community. Um, and so there were these different words, halal, riqueño, 
Um, and that meant like the degree to which you you are close to, like your proximity to whiteness, basically. Um, and so like there were people who were you know at the at the top, the blancos, and at the at the bottom the negros, right? It's like the same way that we have this anti-black society in the United States all across the Caribbean. So it wasn't just Puerto Rico, it was Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, um, Cuba. But, so I think my dad grew up in like this world where like he knew his place as somebody who was kind of um, in the middle of this polarity. And his brother and sister wanted to distance themselves from my grandpa because he was dark. He was like bottom, bottom of the polarity. Um, and they felt ashamed. And my dad still feels that, like, as I've really grown into being comfortable saying that I'm Afro-Latina, I'm fifth generation born into freedom in my family, and that's something to be proud of, um, that when people, you know, dreamed of the, the generations that were kind of after them, I think that people would be really proud of where I am, you know? Um, but for like my dad and my brother, it's still like a lot of shame to have that association. Like that's still something that they push back on. Mm -hmm. um, my brother specifically is always like, why do you tell people that? Like, why do you? Mm -hmm. And so within my family, it's still a big thing. My dad's dad, my grandfather, when he passed away, um, and we went to see him on his deathbed. I came in and I had like my hair straightened and I was like speaking English to my dad. And my grandpa, said this like very like it's not vulgar in the sense of like being dirty but it, it's vulgar like what it means um people in puerto rico used to have this phrase that meant like straightening out the race or like better fixing the race and it was it meant when somebody's who's dark marries whiter and so even if you're like a wealthy black person in puerto rico my grandpa my dad's generation that they had this idea of like if you married white and poor, you were still better in the race. And so he saw me and he like, the, the last things my grandpa ever said to me was this phrase that was like, oh, she's, she's better in the race because I was so light compared to my cousins. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I've become an adult and started like dating people and picking partners for myself, the last, uh, last partner, the partner I'm still with, when I introduced him to my mom, she kind of pulled me aside and, was, and he's, he's dark, he's black. She was like, don't you remember what your Papa Muncho said to you, my grandpa said. Um, because this was still something that they really hold on to that I think their dream is that the third generations will continue to get lighter. Mm -hmm. And for them it's kind of like a slap in the face that I'm not doing that. Um, so within our own family, a lot of a lot of struggles, a lot of shame, a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think out in the world, right, there's, there, the reason that they feel like that is because of like the consequences of the way that they look, that they, that they get from out in the world and the way that they've internalized those messages. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. mm. You identified as a Latina. Uh, how do you connect with, as you were talking about, your dad as black presenting Puerto Rican, um, that being part of who you are and yet being very fair appearing in your family and that being something that's that's lifted up. How, how have you worked with your own identity and reclaimed that sense of, of, of wholeness, I think is what somebody said earlier today, but that sense of of self-love, self-compassion, what, what, what have been some of the elements, and maybe you wouldn't even use these words to describe your identity um, process of, of coming, coming to see these different parts of who you are, um, but could you just say a little bit about how you've come to a, a sense of, of who you are? Um, how have I come to a sense of who I am? I think that if you want to do racial equity work, I think it like kind of forces you into the position of coming to grips with who you are and, and making peace with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I know that phenotypically 
and it's such like it's such muddy water, right? Because race is so socially constructed that what is black to one person might not be black to another person. <laughs> Um, and so I know that phenotypically I'm kind of like in this medium space and I can pass for, for being a lot of things. I think that I can sit in a lot of rooms and tell people I am X, Y, and Z and be believed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if I were going to do this work but not want to claim blackness, that it would be... I don't think I would be able to do that. I think that I would, it would be hypocritical. Or, and um, how can I fight against like anti-black oppression if I can't even accept my own blackness? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I say that knowing that like you know, just because I'm of like black ancestry doesn't mean that like I sit in the same space as people who are who are phenotypically black. Um, because for that exact reason, I pass through a lot of spaces without being seen. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to be comfortable with that too. Because I think it's I think it's two things. Like you don't get to just like claim like oh, I'm black, and so I experience all the oppression of like black folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, I pass through a lot of spaces with a lot of privilege because of my lateness, um, and I think that. I hope to be able, and I, I hope that I do, like I hope that people who think about the kind of work that I do would agree with this. Um, but in case they don't, <laughs> what I hope to do is when I'm invited into spaces where people might be hesitant to invite other black folks, that I create space there um, for, more, for more of us at the table, um, or other people of color in general. Um, so in that way, I think that the way that I look and the body I'm in can be, um, I can use my privilege as something that's that's good for all of us. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that ultimately the people who should be talking about these experiences are people who live with like the, the fullness of them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's kind of, in, in Texas history at least, there's been this discourse of races, uh, so, you know, these social construct of, of blacks and Hispanics and whites, and Native Americans, um, but almost as, as distinct groups. And, and, and as you said, you know, throughout the, the Caribbean, because of the result of colonization, um, you have uh, descendants of slaves who are also uh, related to descendants of um, Spanish colonizers. Yeah. Um, where do you see room in the in different communities where where there is a lot of that um, maybe dialogue about um, just the common common struggles of, of people of color because it seems as though in some in some communities there's less kind of coming together there's like the black community there's Hispanic communities it seems like there's some ways there's the divide and conquer mentality of of kind of white institutions to make people choose one or the other. Um, so I'm not really sure what the question is, but uh, <laughs> do you want to respond to that? I think that, I think in some ways it's good for people to have those spaces where it's like, I'm sitting down with people know my experience. Um, I think that can be really healing and really restoring to not have to like go back and ex have you heard the phrase like explanatory comma? Like um, it's like when you're talking to like your in-group and there's somebody who is not necessarily part of that group who's there and they, they stop you to be like, wait, like what, what is a chancla? And you're like, you know, <laughs> and then you have to like, oh, like take a time out and explain. It can be really restoring restorative and healing to sit with people um, where you can all just talk comfortably, where you can have in-group conversations. And so I do think it's, it's a positive thing um, for people to, to be um, not segregated or not divided, but to make space where it's like we can come together and be in this space and just be 
us and whatever that means, right? Not necessarily along racial lines. I think that it's important for women to have those spaces. I think it's important for people of the LGBT plus community to have those spaces. Um, but I do think, yeah, that there should be room for Latinos to come together, um, for black folks and Asian folks to come together, for white folks to come together and talk about uh, white supremacy and how to dismantle it, mm -hmm. that's important. Um, I think that work has to happen. And at the same time, I think that, especially when you look at, for example, voting suppression and the way they carve up black and Latino neighborhoods, like we tend to live in the same neighborhoods together. Um, and when we don't, Typically, we vote along the same lines, mm -hmm. but they carve us up anyway. And so to think about what do we have in common that we can advance as, as one community. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have our own spaces as long as it still translates into coming together in a second or third space mm -hmm. and talk about what can we do together? How can we advance the same causes that we have? And there are so many, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would say not just, you know, between Latinos and black folks, but poor white folks, mm -hmm. all these people have so many common causes that we really do need to create these other spaces where people are coming together to talk about what do we have in common and how can we push those agendas forward. Mm -hmm. um, what's the kind of sustaining energy for you as you go about your work and uh, are faced with odds of you know, great inequality that you're seeing in uh, all the things that you're studying? What's kind of the sustaining energy for you that gets you excited, that, that gives you strength? Um, I think that's a good question. I get asked that a lot, and I don't know that I've ever. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had like a really good answer to that. I think, um, or I, I think sometimes people ask me that like they're looking for like something that they can replicate. Like how do mm -hmm. how do I take the thing that keeps you going <laughs> and, and make it the thing that keeps me going? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I think for everyone doing this work, it looks different. For me, I guess that thing is that I want to live my commitments. So I, I want to be the person who I ask other people to be, mm -hmm. even when it's hard, um, or even when it's lonely, because I think that there is something like inherently lonely about like pushing for like radical change, right? Um, the more that you push, you start to you start to people start to drop back. Yeah. Um, right? Because uh, some people want like some change, but maybe aren't wanting the the full extent of the things that you want. And so, the further that you push people, the, the more that you lose people along the way. Um, and it, it is it makes sometimes lonely, um, but. The thing that makes me want to do it is, is just that, that I don't think that I would be, I, I don't think I would feel whole mm -hmm. without doing it, mm -hmm. that I get a sense of fullness from the work that I do. That's mm. beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I, I should ask, is there any story or any other um, experience that you would like to share with us that we can preserve um, as a way of sharing your experience as a Latina woman um, living in a racialized society sure. um, that you'd want to communicate with us? Yeah, I have a couple. Yeah. Um, this, so when I was 12, I think, um, I was doing like weekend chores with my dad and went to one of these, like, I don't remember if it was Sam's Club or some other, but one of these places where you go and get like a bunch of for, for less money than you would other, otherwise pay for them, like industrial sized jars of mayonnaise or whatever it is. And so we were at one of these places and um, I wandered away from my dad and I was like 12 so that wasn't strange that like he trusted me to, to come find him. Um, but I wandered away from my dad and I remember that there was this older white man who was like, it seemed like he was following me and I just had not, like I wasn't used to that. I didn't, and I didn't know why and I thought maybe we're just like as he's organically shopping he's ending up in all these same places um and so but I remember that it went on long enough that I started to feel scared and so I went and found my 
dad and this man came, you know, just came right up to, to my dad and I and he was like, is this your daughter? And my dad said, yeah, this is my daughter. And, and he was telling my dad, when I, he, he was like, when I was a young man, um, my buddies and I used to like to take trips down to South America and the Caribbean. And we'd always, you know, we'd always pick up these, these girls to have a good time. And you know, your daughter's just so beautiful. Like she just, she reminds me so much of these girls that, you know, these, these lovely ladies that we'd spend our time with. Um, and I remember, like, my dad just was, like, you know, nodding and being polite and smiling. And then, and so I, and I remember feeling relieved because I don't, I don't know, like, why he had been following me through the store. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember that, like, thinking, like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. And so when he was complimenting, complimenting me, like, I thought, like, oh, this is fine. And, my dad's being nice because this is fine. Um, but then when we left the store and we got back to our car, my dad got in the car and like told me to wait and I could hear him from inside the car just like screaming and like pounding on the steering wheel. And I, he never talked to me about, we never talked about it again. Um, but I, you know, as an adult now, I can look at that and think like what that would have been like for him in that situation to be confronted by someone like that and to not feel that he could react um, in a way that was, you know, probably, in a way that like would have been deserved, right? Um, because I, I was, I was just a kid. And so, and I looked like a kid. And so that's something that, that sticks with me. Um, there have also been, you know, the first time I ever heard the N-word, it was like a, my family lived in like the, the busiest street in all of Colleen, Texas. And I <laughs> remember um, this bus full of like kids from I think Conroe ISD. My dad was mowing our lawn and I was uh, playing with chalk in our driveway. And I remember this bus as it rolled by, like it seemed like all the kids like leaned out their window at the same time to like shout the N word, and I'd never heard it before. And I remember just looking around, like, <laughs> um, but they were shouting it at my dad, and he um, ended up hiring people to do our, to do our yard work after that. He never, like, I never saw him out mowing our lawn again. Because he was so ashamed, um, he felt. And I think you know, knowing now, like the way that he struggles with his identity, um, that that probably was just like one one in like a long line of like narratives of being treated that way that make him feel that way and like shy away from from that identity. Um, third thing. We built a shed in our backyard when I was a kid, and I remember um, we had the gate to our backyard open because we were carrying all these things into the backyard to, to build the shed, and somebody pulled over and just came into our backyard and was like, oh, like, you know, I also need one of these, and um, I don't know what this family is paying you, but I'll, you know, I'll throw in a lunch and some, some cold drinks um, and I and my dad was like this is our house where this is our own but that it like I just remember thinking like oh like this person doesn't even think that this could be our house um, he thinks that we're day laborers like a family of like day laborers um, and his offer is oh, he's gonna he's gonna give us lunch and cold lemonade mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think those are my my big three, maybe, and those were all like childhood experiences and adulthood. Um, I think I've had less things. I did my. It's funny. My so I, I mentioned my partner already. Um, my partner is a really good person, black man, and during 
South by Southwest, um, he had a friend from work who invited him to like meet some of his friends that were visiting from New York. And we like, so I left work and met my boyfriend and his friends downtown. And we went to like a second location with this group of people and then his friend from work was like, we're gonna go, but you guys should stay here. And, and my partner was like, well, why? Like, we can, we can come with you guys. Like, it's not a problem, we don't have anything planned. And he was like, well, one of my friends is, is pretty racist. And, and so Rob was like, against black people? <laughs> and I just remember being like, of course against black people. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Um, and I was just like, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. We won't come with you because you obviously don't want us to because your friends are uncomfortable. Um, but I was like, you know, which friend? And he, he told us. And then my partner was just like, I can't. I, I, was ta I talked to that guy for like half an hour and I thought he was really nice and I can't believe it was that guy. And I think he was also really upset with himself for having that reaction of like against black people. Mm -hmm. As if like, if the guy had been like, well no, he's it's just Arabs. Or it's just, you know, he just is like Mexicans. So that would have been okay. That also would have been a problem. Um, but so he really was upset and we like just spent some time sitting down like on, on the sidewalk is like all these people are, are just going by enjoying enjoying their spring break, enjoying South by, where he was just really hurt. Um, I think that for him to be told like you can't keep hanging out with us, because that's essentially what was being said. You guys can't keep hanging out with us because you're black and your friend doesn't doesn't like black folks. That, that was so he's not as I think I'm a little bit like grizzled and a little jaded. And so for me, it was like, well, that's business as usual, it's fine. <laughs> but for him, this is really, he was really hurt. Um, and the day really took a down turn for him. <laughs> yeah, I think that these like smaller things happen all the time like that. Um, where it's like, that's something small, but it's still, it's still significant. Um, but the stories I mentioned earlier, I think were like much more serious compared to compared to these smaller stories. If you had words for uh, a Lauren who is just like you, except growing up right now in 2018, um, what, what would you want her to know and to hear? About? Just about anything. Um, so I, I think it took, a, it took a long time for me, I'm trying to think of like where I want to start. I think doing racial equity work has taught me a lot about loving myself. Um, and I really think it's like a foundation for me for loving myself. Um, I think without it, I can see things that I did before that I might not have thought were like symptoms of, of not liking myself or not, not liking the body that I sit in. And so I guess like if I were gonna say something to like a younger me that I want her to feel like all the things that, like, you know, I used to like straighten my hair, I used to like hate my hair. Um, it's like really curly and really, like it's, it's a lot of hair <laughs> um, when it's not pulled back, which is why it's pulled back because I woke up late this morning and was afraid Sheila Craig was gonna be mad at me. So I was just like, let me just pull it back. <laughs> um, but I hated, yeah, I hated my, my curly hair. I think that I would tell like a younger version of me how beautiful her hair is and um, tell a younger version of me like that this is, you know, those things about you that you don't like, they're a story about your people, right? They're a story about the people who came before you. Um, all those things are like they're gifts, you know, they're gifts from the people who've like given up a lot so that I could live the life that I live. Um, and to think of them, you know, think of those things as gifts. Um, 
I think I'd start there. That I think, you know, if I were going to raise a little girl, that that would be, I would teach her, I think, self-love from, from the beginning. Um, but I think also, if I were, like if I were, I'm not a parent, I don't know if I will be because I find, I find children scary. But, <laughs> um, I'm not like, not scary, like, like, there's something scary about them, the idea of like raising a person who's gonna go on and like live a life independent of you is something I find like very scary. Um, but I think that if I were raising children today, not only self-love, but I think I meet little kids now. Like I think that there were things that my parents tried to shelter me from in conversations that we didn't have because they thought that if they weren't talking to me about these things, that they were protecting me, um, like preserving, preserving like my like my childhood or something. Um, but I see like small kids all the time who are so well versed in, in identity and so well versed in, in race equity. Um, in ways that like adults struggle with and I think that I'd want to teach that to a kid that I think that all the different ways that adults try and like spare kids from these conversations just mean that they grow up without those foundations you know um, and so I think that I would have you know pushed a younger me toward of the books that, that I really leaned on as an adult um, and helped her get started even sooner. <laughs> like what are some of your favorites in books? Some of my favorite books. I missed out on, because I think that there are like a lot of these, um, not a lot, but I think there are, definitely when I was a kid, there were books for children of color um, to think about themselves as you know, as loved and as beautiful. Um, I missed out on all of those. I know Juno Diaz right now has a book that just came out called Island Born um, about like a little girl who's kind of tracing, she's I think like recreating her family's story and she's a Dominican girl. Um, but as an adult, I think the book that, I always end up like, giving this book to other people and having to order a copy for myself and I like I keep it in my office and I, I lean on it so much it is a book by Derek Bell, it's called And We Are Not Saved and it's a really creative way of talking about the law and anti-blackness um, and how people of color can move forward because I think there's a lot of tension when you think about policy work um, or when you think about academia that a lot of times people push back and say, like, are these things even useful? Is voting even useful? Um, but that he, you know, he talks about the ways that these institutions and that policy have really um, neglected people of color, but at the same time, how can we take that power back in our own hands? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I fall in that book so often. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll have to pick that up. It sounds really it is really good, and it's really, every, every chapter of it is told from like a creative perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just like you're reading about like policy, which I think is something that can be really dry and boring. Mm -hmm. He tells it from like the, um, like the central figure I think is himself, but then there's also a, like a fictionalized character who might be a ghost, and she's kind of <laughs> helping him along. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of like ends in like a spooky place, but it's like, it's really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. He talks about discipline disparities and it's like one day we all wake up and all the black students in, in the United States are gone. And what does that mean? Or he talks about the way that we think about, like, I think sometimes we, we do the what aboutism and we're like, oh, you know, like, what about black on black crime? Or, you know, how much of this is cultural that black people live in these conditions? And so he talks about if there were this, that I think it's like magic rocks and somehow like people start taking these magic rocks and everyone loses, all the black people lose like the inclination to ever do crime. The things that create the crime would still be there. And so 
all these people who are trying to like do well and live like these like perfect um, righteous lives the generations that come after them would still be living within these systems that reproduce crime, reproduce poverty, and would have to fall back on those things. That crime is really this outgrowth of these structural kinds of neglect and racism. So he does a really beautiful job of, um, I think, not just explaining the way that these things are institutionalized, but giving you kind of an image to, to I think, I feel like I keep using found, the word foundational thought, but I think giving you like a story um, that helps you think about these things in a way that's like more tangible. Maybe. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, is there any other story or bit of information that you want to share with us that we can record or? No, I think <laughs> I think I'm done. Yeah. Do you did you have a question? One, I grew up in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. So, my parents a year before I was born, I was there twice a year until I the time I was seven till I was fifteen. So, I understand that. Wow. Majority of my friends were either Puerto Rican, Cuban, or Colombian, yeah. and I used to see it all the time. All my like my mother's friends were real dark skinned in Puerto Rico, and I used to hear that all day. Wow. And then my father had light skinned Puerto Rican. And I show you a picture of my father. You think he's Sicilian Italian, but he's black. <laughs> so my father dealt with it in that perspective too. Mm -hmm. You know, I have people who come up to me, they're swapping down and I'm Dominican. So I'd be like, no. And then I'll be in the Spanish record and they'll say something, I'll be like, oh, and they'll be like, and then they, they'll stop talking. <laughs> so I can relate to what you're saying because I used to see it all the time. I see, I see it now in a sense. And when, and then I'm just recently retired from the military and I was stationed mm -hmm. at Fort Hood from 07 <laughs> to 2012. So. <laughs> That street you said, I know that street. Yeah. I live down the block, probably, and that's how they are clean. Clean is, this is the model for Fort Hood. Uh, welcome to a great place. And what I used to say is, ignorance is bliss. Because the town itself never liked the fact that there was a military installation there. And yes, there were military soldiers who did things that was very misogynistic and wrong but you accepted it because they created a job and a demographic. But it doesn't give them the right to uh, treat people a certain way even though they're in the military and your father was a colonel. So you are the way you are because you lived a structured life to a perspective and at the same time, his pride kept him from really realizing just because you were that, it didn't stop you from becoming a colonel. That's just my interpretation listening to you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's times when I get mad at things like that too. When you talk about your boyfriend, mm -hmm. I would have felt the same way. Because if you speak to me on the phone, I don't sound black. Yeah. My mom taught me how to speak correctly. But when you see me, oh, we thought you were this. No, that's our problem. And I understand, like I said, I understand. And as far as your hair, curly, straight, so what? That was just a Spanish thing. When you wanted to be sassy, you let it curl up and let it hang down. You know, all <laughs> when you wanted to be professional, you put it up and straighten it. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? Mm -hmm. But again, it is what it is. But thank you for your story. Because oh. there's going to be people who feel and think just the way you think. And they're going to be like, there's somebody like me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I'm sorry, I feel like we didn't talk much about like the, the work that these offices do. <laughs> Oh, well, if you want to say anything else, you're welcome to. It's still oh. rolling, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything off the cut. <laughs> <clears throat> Just that, I guess. Um, so, Sheila couldn't be here, but her office was actually defunded. This is, so you said, oh, do you have anything else you want to say? And I said, no. Yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> um, her office was defunded, and I um, mentioned for a little bit that, sorry, there's like a little. A little plug. I mentioned for a little bit that um, her office grew out of work that was happening in child welfare. Um, I think a few years ago, not a few years ago, but I think well over a decade ago, the state lost a lawsuit for over removing children of color um, and putting them into foster care. And at the time, foster care was privatized, so these weren't like well vetted families or anything. These were people who had kind of like passed like a very lax application process and then we're getting paid um, to take in foster youth. And the kids who grew up in those those homes were, were worse off than 
if they've been left with their families. Um, and so the state lost this lawsuit, and out of, I think, this bad publicity, they decided to create what eventually grew into Sheila's program. Um, they decided to create the Center for the Elimination of, Center for the Elimination of Disproportionality Disparities. Mm -hmm. Very long name. Mm -hmm. um, and they moved over the Office of Minority Health into that program's umbrella. Um, what I suspect happened is that there were always people who I think were uncomfortable with this being a program the state was funding. Mm -hmm. um, the Freedom Caucus would always put together something for some schmuck to get up and like read on the floor um, and put it online and it would kind of talk about how like the ridiculousness of the idea of like racism being an institutional practice. And so, you know, we're funding this program that's trying to undo institutionalized racism when it, that's not even a real thing. Um, and so what I suspect happened was that um, people just from the beginning never liked this program. Uh, but now that, you know, the, the real functionality for the state of this program was to make it look better in light of its mm -hmm. lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Now that people have forgotten about the lawsuit, this program no longer serves the state's need for it. And so I think that's why now that program is being defunded. Mm -hmm. um, and what they did was very sneaky. So they, Texas also has a, um, we have like the worst maternal mortality in the nation. Um, maternal mortality being like the year after you give birth, your likelihood of continuing to be alive. <laughs> um, that a lot of moms in Texas die within that first year. Um, so worse in the state, but if you isolated Texas and pretended that it was its own like freestanding developed nation, we would be like worse out of several developed nations, like bottom of the list. And there are some like, I think, places where you would imagine that, that shouldn't be the case, like Yemen, I think. <laughs> That's like places that are actually like war-torn have better um, maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates that Texas does. But so even when you're looking at maternal mortality as a problem that we have in Texas, that problem is even more magnified for black mothers. So even though like 11% of all the mothers who give birth in Texas are black, 30% of the women who die within the first year after giving birth are black. So there's this huge disparity. And with the legislature, it was really sneaky. So they renamed the Center for the Elimination of Disproportionality to um, the Office of Minority Health Statistics and Engagement. And they made it seem like they'd like put this program on like a task force to combat maternal mortality. And they put out these press releases that were like, look at what we did, we created this new program to combat maternal mortality. And what they'd really done was defund this old program and change its name. Mm. So it's really like even still, I think the, the only reason why they didn't defund it last year when they met at that time, because they had the opportunity to do that, was just that they could use like the, the final year of them continuing to fund this office again to further their own needs. And it was, how can we make ourselves look good? We'll create this program. We don't want a lot of money to it. So we'll cut this actual program spending by half so that they only have one more year and then it'll just disappear and nobody will remember it. Now did something a couple of years ago. <laughs> wow. wow. So it's really upsetting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Texas has, we've solved racism. And that's, <laughs> yeah, right. that's why we don't need that program anymore. <laughs> oh, goodness. Wow. Well, is there anything else? I don't think. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Laura. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and, and for sharing your story with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.